There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day, that will be. There'll be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Sing along. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tom. I appreciate that. What a glorious, glorious day that's going to be. A wonderful day. And it might not be long before we see our Lord, the way things are looking today in this old world. Uh, this, this country is bad enough, but it's looking this way all around the world. And again, I think we really believe in my heart that we have a short time left. The reason, one reason I know that we have a short time left is because the Satan, the devil, is doing everything he can to destroy this country, destroy it. I mean, we're fighting against Christians like he's never, like I've never seen before, doing all he can to disrupt the church, and uh, he just. Uh, and and a, a, an alert because he knows he's got a short time left. Amen? Well, I believe that. I believe the scriptures are true. And I believe that what we're seeing, uh, we are witnessing the last days of uh, the day of grace, the great day of the church age, and it won't be long before we see him. What a glorious day it's going to be. I, I, as he was singing that, I was thinking, you know, I always start thinking about that this time of year because I lost my dad in 1977, many, many years ago. How many years ago was that? That was a long time, 47, 48 years ago, something like that. And it's about this time that he was so, so sick. And I'll never forget the day that he passed. We had a funeral course. It was all in August. But I'll tell you one thing, I can't hardly wait to see him again. And I lost my mother. She's up there waiting. My brother, my wife, my sweet wife, she's there. And we're going to see our loved ones that's going on to be with the Lord. Isn't that going to be a grand and glorious day? And the best part of all, though, we're going to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Brother Tom was singing that wonderful old hymn, there's not going to be any more pain, not going to be any more sorrow, not going to be any more suffering. And thank God, no more parting over there. That's going to be a wonderful day. The lady I was telling you about, my cousin who is dying, 
uh, with lung cancer. They called me, her daughter called me yesterday, and I just hadn't seen her this week because uh, we had vacation Bible school going on, and I had the chaplain this week at the hospital. And so I hadn't been by there, but she called and asked me, could I just come by and see her because she's come down real bad the last couple of days. And she said, maybe if you just hear her voice, if you'll come and pray with her because she's in and out of it. And so I told her I'd be glad to. So I went over there, and I pulled that, saw that poor soul laying down in that bed. And she just barely had a, she'd open her eyes a little bit, and, and she would nod her head a little bit when I talked to her. But I prayed with her, and I told her, I said, Sherry, I said, now, we've talked about this. And, and, you know, she'd already asked me to preach a funeral. She said, you know, my good good times, my bad times, and you just share the word of God. And I said, I would be glad to do that. But I said, you know, it's not going to be long, probably. I said, and, uh, and uh, the Lord's going to send an angel to get you. He's going to take you on to glory. You'll see your mom, your dad, and other loved ones. You're going to be up there with them. You'll see Becky. She used to come by and see Becky all the time. And uh, I said, would you tell Becky? I said, hello. And I miss her so much, and I'll see her again soon. But she said she nodded her head. And, uh, but thank God when Jesus comes back, we ain't going to have to go through this anymore. Won't need any more funeral directors. Won't need any more rest homes, hospice, doctors, and such as that. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day when all that's going to be behind us. These old bodies will be redeemed, thank God, according to Romans 8.23. And so the hurt and the suffering part, the sickness, that'll all be behind us. So we, we can look forward to that. Now today I just want to talk briefly about something, especially relating to our vacation Bible school. Well, you say, what can relate to our vacation Bible school? Well, it's this. I wish you could have seen those children out there this week. Just seeing the joy, the happiness, how they were just having the best time, how they was playing and having a wonderful time and the recreation in the class but also in the classroom you know and I was thinking as I was seeing that you know uh, how how wonderful this is to see children here and taking part of that in the classes and then I started thinking about something especially as I got it with him in his classroom one night before we went upstairs he started looking at the at the class roll book he had many years ago when he taught his Sunday school class him and Jason and it was a roll book it's going back to 2007, right? Anyway, he was reading off different names of these kids who was no longer here. And not, not, not only on, not, no longer here, but some not even going to church anywhere. And I thought to myself, that is so sad. But then I started thinking about something else. That word apostasy. We hear that a lot, don't we? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us, that before the rapture of the church and before the Antichrist is revealed, there's going to be a great falling away, a great turning away, a great abandoning of the, the truth of the Word of God, the truth about Jesus, the Word of God, and, and abandon the church as well. There's going to be a great forsaking of the way of God and things of God. But you know, I, I think I see another apostasy today, a great turning away, a great forsaking of the way, of the church, of the truth, of the word of God. And that's found in our youth today. In our youth today. It's such a sad story. And I've given you these statistics so many times in days gone by. About, the, uh, about how the youth are leaving the church. It seems like as soon as they leave the church, they graduate from school and they go off to college. And not only going off to college, but also when they begin their careers or whatever... They abandon the church. They leave the church. Uh, and I had the statistics on it. I was going to read it again. But the truth is, it's far above 50% now, the statistics show that tells us that the young people, when they leave home, they leave the church. You've heard us talk about the, this, the nuns today. When they, fill out, when they fill out questionnaires for jobs, for interviews, for jobs, for college, for, you know, they're always by religious denomination. But now there's a new term today, and it's called nuns. You've heard of this, right? Not N-U-N-S. I'm talking about nuns. N-O-N-E-S. And what that means is if you're not a Baptist, if you're not a Methodist, if you're not a Protestant, if you're not a Catholic, then you must be a nun, which means you are not affiliated with any religious denomination, with really any denomin Christian denomination. With, with that, apart from the, you know, not affiliated with the Catholic Church, 
You're just not affiliated with any religious organization. Uh, nuns. And it's so sad today, but that figure has been going up and up and up by the millennials, the Generation Zs, Xs, whatever they call them today. And so what we're seeing, beloved, is, an, uh, is not the apostasy, but we are seeing a apostasy, right? We are seeing an apostasy, a great abandoning of the church, a great turning away from the faith, a great turning away from what they've been taught, what they've learned here. And I don't know about you, but to me, it's devastating. It's heartbreaking. It's a lamentable truth today that we're seeing how the youth are leaving the church. And not only leaving the church, but in many, many cases, leaving the faith itself. It's heartbreaking. It breaks my heart, and it should break your heart as well, to see what we're seeing today and to witness what we're witnessing today. And so I started thinking about this week, especially again, as I go out here again and see all these kids, the excitement and the, and the classrooms being full, and the vacation Bible school, and then we went, then, but when, then when we come back to church, it's empty. The churches are empty. And so I start asking myself these questions. Well, what can we do? What can we do, we ourselves as the church, or as parents, or as grandparents? I mean, this, this thing is big, and we start saying, well, it's impossible today. Look at the culture. But then we've got to realize, too, as well, it's not impossible because everything's possible with God right and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the church we understand that we know that so it's not impossible but how in the world can we stop this how can we uh, turn this around how can we turn the tide what can we do as a church what can we do as as parents as grandparents what can we do to stop this? Is there something new that we could do? Is there something that we don't know about that we could do? And my, the answer that comes back to me over and over and over and over is no. The only thing you can do is keep doing what the Word of God says. And that's found throughout the Scriptures where we are told over and over and over again. We talk about it on Mother's Day. We talk about it on Father's Day. But uh, we're talking about today on Vacation Bible School Day. You know... The only thing we can do is teach them and train them and bring them up and rear them up and raise them up in the way of the Lord. Look, if you would, we didn't get around this scripture last week on Father's Day, but turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Don't get nervous on me now. I'm going to still let you out. And plenty of time to get an afternoon nap and a meal about 3 o'clock. But Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to look at verse 4. Verse 4. And ye fathers, do you see that? Many theologians and those who interpret the scriptures tell us that this is a generic term, really. And what it's referring to is parents. And you parents, it's a generic term that's found right here. Much like the word meat in the scriptures talks about different kinds of food, okay? We see that over and over in the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. When it says meat, it's talking about food. So it could be many different kinds of food in that term. So what this is talking about right here in verse 4 is not just parents, although the main spiritual instruction for the responsibility is for the fathers, right? But it's talking about parents here. And ye fathers, uh, parents, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't irritate them. Don't push them to the point of exasperation. Don't overcorrect them. Don't uh, do this and push them that way. And that's, that happens many times, doesn't it, as we know. Uh, but don't push them or provoke them or exasperate your children to the point of wrath where they completely turn away from the faith, turn away from the things of God. But, listen to this, bring them up. That means you rear them up, you... You raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. This is what you parents should be doing in these days. Nurture is a word that means that you, uh, you educate your children. It's a word for tutelage. You teach them. You train them. You discipline them. You correct. All that is involved in this word. You correct them with godly discipline, which means when they need to be punished, spanked, you need to do that, but you need to do it in the right way, a loving sort of way, not beat them head to death. I heard Dr. Criswell preach on this one time, and he said the sad thing, and he said this back in 1971 that I found on a message on the Internet, 
and his foundation. They still got 4,000 of his messages. But he said this in 1971 when he was preaching on it. He said this. And he said, I read this this week in one report. And he said, it just, it just tore my heart up. That in that year, he says, that's, that was over 1,000 instances where children were literally beaten to death by their parents in the United States of America. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? So when it talks about discipline, and you can go to the book of Proverbs, you can go to the scriptures, and it says that you, not, you don't need to spare the rod, but you need to train them and correct them in the right way, in a loving way. Not overcorrect them, but do it, discipline them in the right sort of way. And sometimes that does include corporal discipline, does it not? A little spank doesn't hurt anyone. Uh, I got some when I was growing up, and the truth is I didn't get enough. Switches, oh, don't even mention that. I still break out in the house when I hear that word. Uh, but I got my legs well a many times with switches. You probably did as well. Uh, but I, I probably didn't get n nearly the, the whippings that I should have got. Amen? But that's what it means. But we do this. We do this because we love them. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 13, if you don't do that, if you don't discipline your child, if you don't correct them that way, then you hate them. You're doing nothing in the world, but you're hurting them by not doing this. So in other words, that's involved in this word as well. So you train them, you teach them, you literally educate your children. Admonition means the same thing. It means you rebuke your children, you bring them up, you put it into their minds. All You educate them, you teach them, you teach them about the things of the Lord. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Now, some will say, well, that's why we have Sunday school. That's why we have the vacation Bible schools. That's why we have Bible studies and small group studies. But no, all of this, my friends, uh, that's an extension of it. The church is an extension of it. But this training, this education, this teaching begins where? It begins in the home, right? Because you can go back to chapter 5, read the last part of chapter 5. Verses starting verse 22, you'll see instructions to the wives. You'll see it to the husbands in verse 25. You go to chapter one, uh, chapter 6, the next chapter. Verse 1, children obey your parents. The whole setting, the whole context here is the home. Christian education, education about the Lord, about Christ, about the things and the ways of God begins in the home. Amen? Begins in the home. And again, we can see that throughout the Scriptures. For example, look if you would go over to the Old Testament, if you would, and turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. I was going to go to uh, Genesis and show you what Abraham was known to do, but we won't start there. But in Deuteronomy, if you would turn there, if you would, and look if you would in chapter, well, we'll look at chapter 4 to start off with. Chapter 4. And this was when Israel was uh, being taught so many things about the things of the Lord. They were on the plains of Moab, as you see, if you've got a good study Bible, before they was going into the promised land. And they're getting instruction through Moses to the people to do these certain things. In verse 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 4, you got your places? Chapter 9, he is told, the children of Israel is told, Take heed to thyself, keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons, teach them thy sons, and your sons' sons. What he's saying to them is this. Listen, look at verse 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. He's talking about when they saw God in all of his glory, Shekinah glory, and the giving of the law took place. Now, what he is telling the people of Israel through Moses is this. You need to tell your children about the great experiences that you have, that you have had with God, that you've seen God do. Give this to them. Teach this to them. Don't ever let them forget this. You teach them to your sons. You teach them not only to your children, your sons, your daughters, but you teach them to your sons, sons, your grandchildren as well. And that's where many of us are going to come in, right? A lot of, the, the biggest part of us here today are not just parents, what are we? We are grandparents. Grandparents, right? Praise the Lord. And grandmothers, grandfathers, and great-grandpappies. 
I'm a great grandfather. And I started with that great grandmother. You kept saying grandmother. Your great grandmother. I'm a great grandfather. But you see what he's saying here. You teach them to your grandchildren. And you do this. This is your responsibility. He says, I special day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me, that they may learn to reverence me, to honor me, to respect me, all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may, what, in turn, teach their children. It's to be passed on from the parents to the children to the grandchildren, to the great-grandchildren. Isn't this what the Word of God is here saying? There's, there's no new way there's, to do it. There might be new methods, but you stick to the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Chapter 6, same book. Go to chapter 6, if you would. In verse 4, the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, Shema. That's the word in the Hebrew. Listen in the sense of obeying. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, the Lord is our God, the one Lord. God, Jehovah God is our God, and that's one Lord, only one God. You shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart, and you shall, listen to what it says, church, teach them diligently unto thy children. When you see the word diligently, it means that not just do this casually. I'll give them a word here and there. It means that, man, this is going to take work. You got to plan this out. You got it's going to take. Uh, it's, you got to strive to do this. It's hard work. It's going to take a. It's a mighty effort that you've got to do this. So important that it is. You shall talk of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, going down the road. We would say not too many walking today down the road, right? Most of us are driving, right? But usually, if we try, we got the children away sitting in that seat back there or beside us. Hey, when you're going down the road, when you're walking by the way, when you're running down the way, when you're driving, when you're going here and there, look for every opportunity that you can to give your children some kind of lessons about God. And really, it's not hard to do. It's not. I mean, you can draw from life, can't you? You can find from your experiences and you can see things that you'll have opportunities to teach your children, your grandchildren about the Lord, about the things of God. So he says, you talk about them when you walk by the way, when you're lying down, when you're rising up. In other words, saturate them with the word of God. Bind them for a sign upon the head. There's frontlets between that. They even laid on the head little boxes. They put verses of scripture in it to, so they would remind them to share this with their children. You shall write them upon the post of your house and on thy gates and uh, put up things that will remind you to remind your children, teach them about the Lord. We used to go every trip that we used to go on sometimes, we'd go to the mountains or go to the beach. We'd go in these little shops and we'd see these little, look like handcrafted places, you know, where they have a verse of scripture uh, about that would come out of the word of God, sometimes the commandments of God, sometimes about honor your father and your mother, things like that. You know, hang them up in your house. Again, that will draw attention to those children sooner or later. Amen? So, again, it goes on in chapter 11, if you would. Same book, if you would. In chapter 11, again, the same instructions. Verse 18, we see in chapter 11, verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart. All these things that you're hearing from God, Moses is saying. Bind them for a sign upon your hand. They shall be, may be as frontless between your eyes. And listen to this, you shall teach them, your children, speaking of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, when you're rising up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. In other words, what he's saying, he's saying simply this, uh, make it a part of your conversation. I don't care what you're doing, where you're at. Whether it be recreation, whether it be play, whether it be in home, maybe over a meal or something like that. But look for opportunities, and God will provide those opportunities for you to share with your children about the things of the Lord. Old Dr. Criswell said this, and I'm going to tell you, it's very, very important. He said this. He said, well, some parents will say, and I mentioned this, I think, last week on Mother's Day or Father's Day. 
They will say, well, you know, I don't want to force this on my children. I don't want to, you know, again, maybe they're coming along of overcorrection. It might be psychologically damaging them. I don't want to push them into this. I want them to make up their own minds. I want them to, you know, not, I don't want to force them to go to church. I don't want to force them to read the Bible. I'm not going to push this on them because it could probably do more harm than good. You just keep on believing that lie of the devil. If you want, you leave them alone. You just let them go. Let them make up their own mind. And you know what's going to happen? Listen, they'll find what they want out there in the world. They will get up with these dope peddlers, these uh, alcohol, these drunks and such things, that, that the ways of the world. You don't teach them in the early days. Of their youth. You just let them go. You let them make up their, their own mind. And I'm going to tell you what, Satan will help them make up their mind. Just leave them alone. Let them go. And you'll regret it for the rest of your life. The only way, my friends, the only hope that we've got in training up our children in the ways of the Lord is start with them when they're young. Teach them the habits and the ways of the Lord, and those things will stay with them for the rest of their life. They are current with them. That's what the Scriptures are saying. All through the Scriptures, that's the instruction from the Word of God. Amen? To teach them the things of God. But let me say this, and let me close with this very very, something very important. While you are doing this, while you're teaching them the things of God, and while you're teaching them the Word of God, and while you're trying to make these illustrations, while you're doing these things that we've just been talking about, the, the, but the most important thing, the main objective that you need to have, your goal should be this, is to win them to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do everything you can through the Scriptures, through the object lessons of the Scriptures, do everything you can to win them to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I am convinced, I know this, the Bible teaches this, and you probably know it as well, that if you bring your child to saving faith in Christ, what's going to happen? When they truly believe, when they truly believe on Jesus, who comes into their life? He does, doesn't he? By way of His Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that when a person bleeds on Jesus, that his body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit moves in. And He lives there, inhabits you, and He will stay there for the rest of your life. Amen? He will be with you because the Word tells us, Jesus said, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Did He tell His disciples that? His apostles that I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you introduce your child to Christ, when you lead them to the Lord, when they're saved, when they're born again, the Spirit of God moves in. He will be with them. He will stay with them. No matter where they go, what they do, He will be there. He will guide them. He will instruct them. He will impress them. He will convict them. He will never lead them. Amen? And even if they do get out of the way, listen, and that happens, right? I, in my life, I went nuts one time. Do you, did you do that? You know what I'm talking about, right? But you can, you, can, you can backslide. I know that's possible. You can't get off the path that you should be on. But if you're truly saved, if you're truly a child of God, He's not going to let you alone. He's going to be there. He's going to convict you when you're wrong. And eventually, I believe, he'll bring you back. Amen? Train up a child in the way that he or she should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. If they do, I believe they'll come back. Amen? Amen? Let's stand by heads by our eyes closed. Sister Thelma, play a one stanza or two stanzas of Just As I Am. There might be someone here this morning that's never come to know the Lord Jesus. Um, I don't know of a better time to do this or uh, to rededicate, recommit your life to Christ. If there be any need of that this morning, uh, I'll be down here in the front and she'll be playing. And it might be someone here today that's never given their heart to Christ. I can't think of a better time to do that than right now. But whatever the need is, the Lord will meet that need. And Father, we're so thankful again for your many wonderful blessings, Lord. We're so thankful for the great vacation Bible school we had, Lord, for the children, for every child that was there. We thank you, Lord, for the teachers that sowed the seed among the kids, Lord, 
and we feel like they learned things this week that they'll carry with them and we with them the rest of their life. Maybe we didn't hear of anyone coming to know Christ this week, Lord, but we, again, the seed was sown, and we know that somehow, some way, perhaps they'll come to know Christ. And Lord, we pray for this invitation now that might be someone here today that's never truly come to know Christ. Might be someone that needs to do that today. It might be someone here today, Lord, that also needs, need, maybe perhaps need to recommit their life, rededicate their life to Christ or their home to Christ. But whatever the need is, Lord, we pray that you will meet it and we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.